Hey everyone, um, Professor Foster here coming to you from my home office. Um, so we need to take some time to cover uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and a couple of poems by Elizabeth Bishop, uh, two things that were on the syllabus that we um, were not able to get to in class. But um, we still need to uh, know a little bit about them uh, so we can uh, answer some questions on the third exam, right, pertaining those two texts. So let's start with Ellison. Um, Invisible Man uh, came out, uh, I believe it was 1953, and it is one of the um, not only greatest works of, you know, African American or uh, black literature uh, for the 20th century, it's also just straight up one of the um, most important novels of the 20th century uh, period. So it's, uh, we, we would be remiss if we did not take a few minutes to, to talk about it. And, uh, our, our anthology only gives us, um, the prologue in the first chapter. So, um, let's just do a quick introduction, uh, and then we'll, we'll look at some, some, uh, evidence from the text itself about Invisible Man. So, one very important thing we need to know about this novel uh, to contextualize it is Ellison, uh, this is his only novel, so, um, you know, he's kind of a one-and-done uh, novelist, but he really didn't need to, to do much work. Uh, he, he kind of uh, rode off the success of this novel for the rest of his career. Uh, that's how good it, it was and still is. Um, to this day. So, a few important key concepts we need to understand first is um, probably probably to package this in with, with another work that came out right around the same time, um, Death of a Salesman, right? We are, we are getting into this postmodernism. We're getting into works that deal with this existentialism, right? Um, existentialism is, you know, where you start to just question your place, your belonging uh, in the universe, the way the universe works, right? How you fit into that. Um, if you ever hear the term existential crisis, that's what it's talking about, right? So we see that with Death of a Salesman to some degree, and we see it um, a lot here in Invisible Man, okay? Um... Right, so starting with the title, um, starting just with the title, we, we know that this text is going to revolve around um, a character, a protagonist, who um, identifies as this invisible figure, right? But how is that dealt with in the text itself, right? So, um... <sighs> Going along with that that concept of the existentialism, that philosophy, um, it's important to note about this book, um, if you think back to Everyday Use by Alice Walker, right? That was a, a short story that very much was making a statement about what it meant to be african-american to, to be a participant in black culture at this time in america we saw two sides of it with d and with mama right so that was a short story um you know alice walker was definitely making a statement about both sides of that african-american experience this novel d does not really um make a statement like, like Alice Walker's short story does. Um, it doesn't make a societal statement uh, as far as this is the, the correct way that it should be or, um, you know, black culture needs to be this or it needs to be that. It, it really questions all of American society at one time through the lens of this unnamed narrator who is black um, but he does not identify with, you know, this movement or that movement. Um, 
he he views everything through this this existential lens. So it's almost like the the blackness of it, the the race aspect of it is secondary here to the unnamed narrator's own existential musings, right? So it's it's uh it's a very interesting approach um to to say, well, what if we look at the individual and their own personality instead of just defining or uh, sticking them into this movement, sticking them into this stereotype or categorization? Um, what if we just took away all of that and looked at them as their own individual person, and then all these other things are secondary to that, right? So we see that in action here with Invisible Man, okay? So we start with the prologue. Um, our unnamed narrator is living in a hole in New York City. He moves from the South uh, thinking it would be better in New York City, right? But he realizes it's, you know, not really better. Um, so he kind of has withdrawn from society and he's trying to piece everything together, um, you know, his place in society, how he interacts, right? So uh, existentialism is the name of the game here. So uh, I've used that term a lot. So you might want to uh, take a note of that, right? That might be something you can use when you're uh, doing a response with your exam, okay? So let's take a look. So I'm going to read a little bit from the prologue, and then I want you on your own to cover chapter one, which is Battle Royale, which is quite literal. Like, it is a literal Battle Royale, and I want you to read and study up on that so you can see for yourself what that's talking about, okay? So let's read um, some of the opening here in the prologue of Invisible Man, okay? I am an invisible man. No. I'm not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as it is if, or it is as though I have uh, been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. Notice that he has not, at any point in this opening paragraph, mentioned that he is a person of color. Right? He has not mentioned a single thing about that, because that is not the approach that this novel is concerned with necessarily it's there right it is the subtext but we are looking at the existential ponderings of the individual with all of those other things removed all those societal labels taken away right that's what we're working with here in this opening passage this is a an important line here this is a uh, if you have the textbook 191 when they approach me they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. Nor is my invisibility exactly a matter of biochemical accident to my epidermis. That invisibility to which I refer occurs only because of a, pe a peculiar disposition in the eyes of those with whom I come in contact. Okay, that's important right there. A matter of the construction of their inner eyes. Those eyes which they look through their physical eyes upon reality. I'm not complaining, nor am I protesting either. It is sometimes advantageous to be unseen, although it is most often rather wearing on the nerves. Then to you're constantly being bumped against by those of poor vision. Or again, you often doubt if you really exist. Existential crisis, right? <clears throat> you wonder whether you, are, you aren't simply a phantom in other people's minds. Say a figure in a nightmare with 
uh, which the sleeper tries with all of his strength to destroy. It's when you feel like this that, out of resentment, you begin to bump people back. And let me, let me confess, you feel that way most of the time. You ache with the need to convince yourself that you do exist in the real world, that you're a part of all the sound and anguish. And you strike out with your fist, you curse, and you swear to make them recognize you. And alas, it's seldom successful. Okay. So he goes on to describe an instance where he bumps into a pedestrian walking on the street. And then he goes on to viciously beat him. Um, the narrator beats the pedestrian, telling him to apologize for bumping into him, right? But to the pedestrian, the narrator is invisible, okay? Uh, the end of this uh, section, the bottom of 191, says, I didn't linger. I ran away into the dark, laughing so hard that I feared I might rupture myself. The next day, I saw his picture in the Daily News beneath a caption stating that he had been mugged. Poor fool. Poor blind fool. I thought with sincere compassion, mugged by an invisible man. Okay. So that first section, you know, first couple of sections there in the prologue do a very good job of um, establishing the narrator, right? If you have the book, if you flip over, um, right, we start to get more of the race factor that starts to kind of uh, sprinkle in here. Um, but the important thing is to note that when this novel starts, right, there's virtually no mention of race. There's there's almost none. And then it starts to kind of seep in, right? So if you look at uh, 194, we have this uh, very kind of postmodern uh, section, right, with the, with the text on the page. You can look at that, right? We get some more insight to the narrator. And then on 197, chapter one, Battle Royale, right? So, um, I want you to look at that on your own, okay? And, um, like I said, Chapter 1, Battle Royale, is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. So, um, what's important here, since, since the anthology, unfortunately, gives us so little to work with, with Invisible Man, only the prologue and the first chapter, it's important for us to know the context, right, of the novel. And then we can see a little bit of how it starts to shape out. Uh, we, of course, don't get the full novel, but we get the prologue in chapter one. So uh, make sure that you take note on what I covered uh, in the first part, right? The themes, the philosophy behind the novel, and then take that into reading the prologue in chapter one, okay? So um, let's end this video and we will transition over to the Elizabeth Bishop poems.